Ashtanga Yoga and Daily Life. Let's begin.
sadhana, first the fire. Some purification is necessary. You probably noticed that uh, you have, or we all have, even Eddie. And Eddie is very clean. <laughs> still has some impurities <laughs> somewhere at the very deep. <laughs> so first we need to burn away the impurities uh, and literally to be brought to our senses. Uh, you know, perfection of the sense organs. You know, maybe after a particularly wonderful yoga class, maybe even after, you know, this morning's wonderful yoga class, you walked outside and your senses felt deliciously open and awake and discerning, <coughs> receptive. Yeah? yeah? Anything like that ever happened to you? It's like you're in a heightened state of awareness, right? It's a nice state of awareness to be in, right? Because in that really open, discerning state, we tend to be a little more discerning in how we feed our sense organs. And this is important because if we feed our senses junk food, what happens? Oh, then we need the sacred fire <laughs> even more. So eventually we come to learn self-discipline, as Nancy stated it. We, we come to make more intelligent choices about uh, how we feed our sense organs. So, I mean, some people seem to believe in the, the binge and purge <laughs> methodology. <laughs> but I, I think it probably slows down the rate of self-realization a little bit, the binge and purge. So, you know, the, the idea is once you enter the sacred fire, when you emerge from the sacred fire, you're not quite the same person. You've left something behind that was just kind of clogging you up and weighing you down. And, you know, Guruji was really the master of creating the sacred fire when he taught a yoga class. There was nothing quite like it. You know, for the guided classes, uh, he had a particular knack for taking you out of your comfort zone, whatever that might be, you know. Whenever you thought you wanted to go fast, he would go slowly. Whenever he wanted to go slowly, he would go quickly. Uh, so at the end of the class, you always sort of felt like you'd been dipped in fire. <laughs> and you, you had been rearranged in some profound manner. Which was a good thing, because ideally, a good practice should alter us for the better. Anyway, so Tapaha is that important first step to get the poisons out, to, to cultivate a state of clarity. You know, uh, this process has been likened to the refining of gold. If you have unrefined gold, how do you refine it? We have to heat it up, right? We have to melt it. And in the liquid state, the pure gold separates from the impurities. Impurities can be skimmed off. Or if you ever make ghee, it's a similar sort of process. Right? You melt the butter, what happens? Something floats to the top. What is it that floats to the top there? Cholesterol. Artery clogging melts off. Something usually settles to the bottom of the pot as well. What is that stuff? <laughs> Those are like the heavy metals or something. <laughs> anyway, so tapaha works in, in the same way. You know, it separates the essential from the inessential. And uh, it leaves us in a heightened state of awareness. So it sets the stage for the, the next critical aspect of sadhana, which is supposed to be my topic, sorry to backtrack, but I was just, you know, trying to create a sense of continuity from... <laughs> so, uh, that's 
second aspect of, uh, of sadhana is, is called swadhyaya. Swadhyaya, we talked about it at length yesterday afternoon, so I've said about as much as I have. I can say a couple more things. Um, so swadhyaya, literally self-study, which traditionally includes study of the sacred texts. Um, but I think importantly too, just daily in, engaging in some process of self-inquiry, especially when things go wrong in life, you know, to really reflect on our actions, think, God, I really screwed that one up. And I wonder why that happened, and to really reflect on that, or when things go well as well, it's just, wow, that went really well. What did I do right? <laughs> so unusual. <laughs> but that basically that all of life offers itself to us as a kind of mirror for reflection. And you know, the universe is always trying to instruct us in some way if we're open to the lesson that it's offering us at any given time. <coughs> and you know, even when we practice asana, we could think of the asanas as metaphors for the different circumstances that we encounter in life when, you know, sometimes we have to be strong, sometimes we have to be flexible, sometimes we have to endure discomfort, sometimes we have to bend over backwards. <laughs> <laughs> So in each of those situations, what are we asked to do? We're asked to have both stila, but also sukha, you know, to be steady, but also to be happy, to be at ease, to be receptive. You know, to, to have prayatna, to find the appropriate effort, but also to have shaitilyam, to find the appropriate surrender. So the asana practice is, uh, it's a great training ground for life. It's a great opportunity for self-study. Um, I remember once in India, <coughs> seeing a Vedic astrologer, how many Vedic astrologers can you see? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, but he says, yes, why did you come to India? And I said, well, I'm here studying yoga. He said, oh, very good. Yoga will make you a human shock absorber. <laughs> so that was his way of saying that the practice of yoga helps us to be more adaptable to the changing circumstances of life. And you know, self-study is something that uh, does that for us as well. Um, again, Patanjali gives another sutra with this. We talked about this yesterday, remember? Can we say this one together? Swadhyaya. Swadhyaya. Samrayogaha. Samrayogaha. Okay. So through this process of self-study or through study of the sacred text, Samrayogaha it means we attain union with that thing in the middle, right? The Ishta. Devata, the deity of choice, or the preferred deity. We don't have a real strong tradition of this in the West, uh, the deity of choice, of course. In India, how many different uh, forms do they have of the divine? 330 million. 330 million, thanks. <laughs> So there's obviously a lot to choose from. Uh, but the tradition in India is that, you know, families have a deity that, that gets passed down from generation to generation. So if you look at pictures of Guruji and you see all that stuff on his forehead. <laughs> So those three lines of ash on the forehead indicating which particular 
So we have this threefold pattern uh, that makes Kriya Yoga uh, Tapas, uh, Sadvaya, and Ishvara Pranika. And so it's an interesting pattern that um, I'll point out, you know, I'll try to express that pattern in other ways so we can see if there's anything there. But what is it? I'm, I'm wondering, what is it about in the process of sadvaya, or really looking in to yourself, self-contemplation, that came after you got toasted in the fire of practice, uh, or humiliated in the fire of practice? <laughs> and you go in and you, you start really like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, you're repentant, or sometimes you're just like remorseful, or apologetic, or just curious. Um, there's something in that stage of practice where you're kind of contemplating all of the things that we used to think were sloth or you that aren't really you. There's something right on the edge of that. And you're really like, all of a sudden, you get this little bit of an opening that then becomes the final niyama of Ishvara Pranidana, which we can translate as one surrender to God or surrender to Ishwara. I don't know if God is the correct translation for Ishwara. More about that later. It's a good translation, but I don't know if it's the best translation. Um, and there are two senses um, that are implied. One is a passive surrender, uh, which some of us are good. <laughs> And that is, uh, in, in a contemplative state, uh, one all of a sudden experiences that everything that is occurring, um, everything that is arising in, as experience, uh, is Ishwara. It's enveloped by Ishwara. It's penetrated by Ishwara. And just the realization of that causes you to let go of it. Uh, there's a famous verse that begins the Ishopanishad. Um, I'm going to resist chanting. <laughs> anyway, it says all of this, I mean, all of this meaning everything that's around you, subtle and gross, inside of you, outside of you, every little sensation, every little inspiration or respiration, uh, every hope, desire, grand scheme, map that your mind makes, um, the calluses on your heels, the, uh, everything is enveloped by Ishwara. Okay, which we can translate, some of us, God is a good translation. Other we could just say, uh, Ishwara is pure awareness, pure chit, pure consciousness. But everything is Developed by that, penetrated by that. So essentially is that. And so at that point of realizing that something, um, this is when something, this is when Asteya really comes into play. Um, this is not mine. Um, I don't know whose this is, but <laughs> But you realize that even about all of these subtle components that were once part of your personality, or what you thought was your personality, or your emotions, your memories, any configuration of subtle or gross energy, you realize, oh, this is not mine. It is Ishwara. And a non-different from that realization that going, aha, is leaving it be. Because there's no structure outside of it to then try to make something else out of it. You kind of come to the, the end of the line, the end of the universe. Um, and in that letting it be, the, uh, this verse from the Isha Panishad would say, this is real pleasure, or truest pleasure, truest enjoyment comes from tiag, or releasing. Because you're letting the intrinsic nature of whatever it was you thought was you or had a separate self 
Um, its intrinsic nature is pure, open awareness, <coughs> radiance, consciousness. That's what it is. And you realize it in that form, moment of realization, there's release, which is like vairagyam or tya. So that would be the, the passive sense of the Ishwara. I'm sure we all experience this in a few seconds or something. <laughs> Please surrender. Just leave it be. And that implied in the uh, sense that it's Kriya Yoga, which is done at the that first verse of the second chapter of the Yoga Sutra, that was the Yoga of Action. Of course, we've learned from the Gita that action itself is Brahman. Action itself is the sacred. Because the, the mind likes to think dualistically. Action is what you do until you finally rest at the end of the line or something. But the action itself is utterly sacred. And there's no doer, there's no outside ego doing the action. It's just what is occurring. So there's the sense of active surrender in which you dedicate. And one of the meanings of the word pranidana is to dedicate, to offer uh, everything to Ishwara. You know, so I offer my life, I offer um, my dinner, I offer um, everything. All of my thoughts, all of my actions. Uh, even when I brush my teeth, you're doing it ultimately for Ishwara. I'm sure the Ishwara doesn't <laughs> but, um, but in other words, you're giving, giving, giving. So rather than the passive sense uh, can be reduced very easily to the sense of give me something. Although in the realization there's no subject or object, but instantly the mind you know, takes over and says, oh, please take care of me, God. You know, there's this kind of selfishness. I wish my kundalini would have been. <laughs> so selfishness comes back in. So the, the other implied meaning, the active one, is let me give, give, give everything. Let me, you know, even if I have a false self or some of it, let me make that useful to other beings. Uh, a, a curious thing that's parallel, there's where many of us are familiar with, with uh, the Buddhist concept of the uh, Bodhisattva. Um, yeah. 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 So Bodhisattva is uh, someone who, within the, the Mahayana, the, the great vehicle of Buddhism, um, has come to the point where they uh, are very close to full enlightenment. But what's really been awakened in them is this insight into others. And so they've become very much uh, filled with compassion for other beings. And so to them, the greatest joy is helping other beings. Um, any of them are still caught in ignorance and are suffering. And so the Bodhisattva is someone who's right on the verge of enlightenment, or we could actually say, actually, they're actually enlightened. The Bodhisattva vow is non different. Buddha. And they vow, I never, I don't want to become a full Buddha and just like check out. Um, as long as there's any being anywhere um, who can use that I can help. And so they take this vow to keep coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back uh, until all <coughs> sentient beings are liberated. So I like in my yoga class to keep people in upward dog. Um, the upward dog vow. I'm going to stay in the upward dog until all sentient beings come into the upward dog vow. <laughs> At least everyone in this classroom gets into the upward dog. So there's a social pressure. Right? And now we go into the downward dog. Um, but that's, think how many beings there are. So it's, it's quite an immense mind stretcher. The, the Mahayana Buddhism is they're just stretching your imagination, like way into your emotions, way beyond any limit. But the word for the Bodhisattva vow is 
Bodhisattva Pranidana. I wonder if Papa John knew that. <laughs> But it also a curious thing. And so, someone who takes the active form of Ishvara Pranitana, Kriya Yoga, has the vision that's revealed by in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna keeps saying that the highest yogi is one who sees me in all beings, and all beings in me. And so, uh, we develop in Ishvara Pranitana, we, we see. Krishna, we have to find out who Krishna is, but he's right there. <laughs> and we actually see all beings, that's who is at the very center of the heart of all beings. And we, in the language of the Gita, are then um, dedicated to that vision, and we serve other beings by revealing that vision to them, by setting them free or giving them So, uh, as a bodhisattva, we would say, may all beings be happy. Um, as a uh, practitioner of Ishvara Pranayama, we would say, may all beings have the vision of all, seeing all beings in their heart. So, in that way, we, uh, it goes back then to ahimsa, to our, the way we perceive uh, other beings and the way we relate to other beings. So, Ishvara Pranayama immediately takes you right back to start over. That means, uh, don't take off the bird. So, back to this pattern. So, tapas svadvaya, ishvara pranidana. Shankaracharya, the Tommy Joyce's great grand, 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 great grand, 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 a few times. Uh, guru, uh, who was careful to point out that Vishnu is the heart of Shiva and Shiva is the heart of Vishnu. Therefore, they're not really that different. Uh, he was brilliant, uh, remover of sectarian uh, fighting. And still today, people fight over him. You know, they talk about Shankaracharya because he kind of undoes their specialness. Well, my Ishwara is better than your Ishwara. <laughs> Allah can beat up Jehovah any day. <laughs> Can't compare. Okay. And people fight over this stuff. Believe it or not. <laughs> I hope you're familiar with that. And Shankaracharya kind of like deflates, you know, the kind of egoism, egotism that grows around you know, conceptions of Ishwara. But he describes the process of samadhi, uh, that it, it's three stages. And the first stage in samadhi is um, the vritti, the chitta vritti, that little, you, know, that you think, oh, we got to get rid of these things. But that chitta vritti is to be observed and made still. That way you can find that like, observed, you know. Okay, this thoughts are rising all the time, driving me crazy. Okay, we <coughs> are check out to see what's what's going on here. What are these things? Any substance to them at all? And so you carefully you create a space through tapas. You create a sacred space in which you can arrive, watch whatever arises, which are pretty. And it becomes still a calm, so you're not pushing or pulling. And then when the Vritti is stable. This is meditation. Brahmakarataya uh, vrittya. You see that the vritti, the chitta vritti, is actually Brahma. Stage two. Okay. Wow. So you were being bothered the whole time by Brahma. <laughs> And then the third stage is Vritti Vismaranam Samyak. Um, samyak just means completely, completely, totally, you forget it. 
So the mind gives up theoretical object, it's still paying close attention to the material, but it's not projecting as, uh, what is essentially an unnecessary theory of the object onto it. And that in doing that, it gives up the creation of a theoretical subject or a false observer. And then, so it's perceiving what Patanjali says, it's a svarupa shunyam, as if it were empty of self-form. And that's just samadhi. And so, what comes from Ishvara Pranidhamma, the, the Yoga Sutra goes on, um, samadhi siddhir Ishvara Pranidhamma. From Ishvara Pranidha, Pranidha um, from surrender to Ishvara, comes the perfection of samadhi. <laughs>
very frankly, when I was younger, um, I thought about, in fact, I didn't even really think about it. I was um, searching for this thing called enlightenment. That's kind of why I started doing yoga. Um, when I started doing yoga, I didn't know anything about postures. All I knew was meditation and chanting. Um, and um, my whole understanding about it from what I was being taught from the, this uh, ecstasy dealer who was... Um, <laughs> Um, when I first started doing actual yoga poses, I had no idea whatsoever what they had to do with, with enlightenment um, or anything like that. Um, it's back in 1986, 1987. Um, and, um, but I kept doing them anyway. Um, and so, you know, back then it was one conception, but uh, very honestly, since some um, when I met Guruji um, and started doing his practice and felt like uh, it was the first time that I was really um, doing yoga, that everything I've been doing, different types of yoga before that, and, uh, learned a lot of different poses and breathing techniques, but that what he was doing, everything kind of pulled together. It all gelled in sort of one place at one time, and I felt, wow, this is like yoga. This is really it. Um, and I stopped looking for enlightenment. Um, I practically even stopped thinking about it um, because it was something in the future and um, and I was more interested in what was going on in the present so I can't answer the question what is enlightenment or does it exist um, or any of the other three things that were asked about um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to those um, what I was interested in was, I was interested in learning what Guruji knew. Um, I was interested in learning uh, how he could see people so clearly um, and read them and understand them and see what their needs were um, at that, you know, at the moment. Um, what was troubling them, you know, what their strengths and weaknesses were. I was wondering, how can he do that? It was intriguing me. How could he see things about me that I didn't even understand about myself? So all that became a lot more interesting to me than um, some idea about um, a state that I may or may not ever reach or be in order or maybe even exist. Um, uh, so now, you know, it's still pretty early on in the game. I have some time left. And right now, um, I'm, I mean, I would hope I have some time left. And I don't need two minutes, but I need some years. <laughs> Because 
um, just attending to the things that you have to attend to in life with care and with attention. Um, open up the unexpected quite often. And we find ourselves in a space where we think, okay, wow, this is really, um, you know, this is an interesting thing, or this is a nice thing, or this is an important thing, or this is something that I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, which, um, you know that old t-shirt, enlightenment, it's not what you think. Have you seen that t-shirt? <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so that's my answer to the question for, for the time being. Um, you know, householders aren't supposed to be too interested in enlightenment because it takes them away from the things they have to attend to. Um, so, I, forgive me if that's not a satisfactory answer. Um, and I now, uh, that's one thing that I wanted to say actually, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to wait to the end. So, I'm going to let everyone answer all these questions because I don't, I don't want to sidetrack. But I would like to clarify one thing I was saying about Guruji and the Vaishnava and Shabbat thing. So I want to say that at the end, okay? I'll say it. I'll say it. <laughs> Does anybody else want to respond to the Facebook thing, you read it on your Facebook wall, you know. 
know or something, but <laughs> so the frightening thing is, what if this is enlightenment? What if this is as good as it gets? Oh no! <laughs> Okay, what if I've got the power? Okay, now you're all in life. How is it going to change your life? Mommy, Daddy, I'm late for school. Mommy and Daddy are in life. As a landlord, you're late on your rent. I'm in life. It's really not going to do much good. You can be certified enlightened person. Whatever, but you got to get on with your life. So the Zen Buddha said, oh, before enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. After enlightenment, I chopped wood and carried water. So really, the whole concept is kind of overrated because even if you get there, you still got to do what you're doing. So you may as well just keep doing what you're doing. Um, so why do we do it? Um, I'm going to give a real quick David Williams comment. I like the boy. Most fast one of the videos that have said, David, why'd you get into yoga? He goes, well, when I was younger, I heard about yogis in India who grow older and wiser. I looked around my neighborhood and all I saw was people getting older and sicker and sin. I went to India like a detective to find the most classical yoga system I could. When I found this Shanga yoga, I, I knew it was what I was looking for. And now I figure I'm just going to practice this for 50 or 60 years and see what happens. <laughs> So you got to give it like 50, 60 years to see if it's working. And then later I'm going to go, I'm going to do more bowling next time. <laughs> and so there was a time without going into great detail of, I was seeking answers all over the place. I was just looking everywhere for answers. You know, fasting, I ate nothing but grapes and grape juice for 40 days. And got hungry and went to the Hare Krishna temple and got free food. And, uh, <laughs> And so I looked everywhere for answers until I woke up one day and realized answers are overrated. Because what happens many times we get an answer and we stop questioning. So if an answer means stop questioning, then that means you can't learn anymore. As soon as, as, soon as we think we know it all, there's nothing to le left to learn. So our container is tightly sealed and whatever information and knowledge comes just runs down the side. So questions contain, contain the quest, right? So questioning and wondering and, and all that, I think, is the juice. And to be satisfied with, with questions that don't have the answer is kind of easier place to be. Or maybe it's just a comforting cop-out. But um, I think that the juice lies within the quest. I'm going to uh, ask Rachel to start this next uh, first answer here because his name is on here. What does it mean to practice all day and all night? Richard says this all the time. I didn't think so. It's a joke. Oh, okay. Vivid or lucid dreaming. 
So you're, you're still dreaming. You're aware that you're dreaming. And so even in your dreams, you can practice uh, discriminating awareness. Uh, it could even be non-violent in dreams. Have you ever had a dream in which you were violent? And then you feel it got even though it was just a dream. And so, or even when, when you're doing cartoons and things, you know, it's like one imaginary character bites off the head of another imaginary character. <laughs> then the, you still feel in your imagination that, that feeling. And so, even in your, when your imagination is gone, you're still practicing. And this you do all the time. 24 7, seven days a week, even on moon days. <laughs> and major holidays. <laughs> and so this is why they say that the, the path, the Brihat Karanyaka Upanishad, early school, says the path is like, oh, it wasn't that, it was Kata Upanishad, I'm sorry. <laughs> it says that the path is like a razor's edge. And so even from moment to moment, there are all types of complex things arising in the mind. And that if you're really attentive to them, curious about them, you know, rather than, oh, I, I know what they are, like, well, uh, this is it. And if you're, you're practicing, and it's just like a razor slicing through the time-space continuum, it's like the constancy of the razor's edge. And that's all that you're being asked to do. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much for this part today. Okay, Tim, we're going to go with you next. What do you think about the recent articles in the New York Times about yoga induced injuries?
and the amount of comments that came in closed down their comment section, which goes to show it was a really good move on the part of the New York Times. I think that, um, you know, it, it, there are a lot of really good yoga teachers, and there are um, a few not so good yoga teachers, and there are a lot of very careful practitioners, and a, a few you know not so careful practitioners. Uh, we all know all these things already, it's obvious. Some people are well-trained and some people aren't well-trained. We need to be discerning and we need to be careful. Um, but I think, it, since the question was about the New York Times, my basic response is it was inflammatory on purpose for William Broad to sell books. And um, his last article, which was basically saying that yoga you know, started from a sex cult, as if it's a bad thing. <laughs> is also inflammatory. And so now you have, you know, William Broad is coming to the New York Times go to yoga guy, which is actually a crying shame because um, he doesn't really know that much and his research is incredibly faulty. Um, so, you know, what's the solution? I have no idea. What I'd really like to do is I'd like to challenge William Broad to an old style big debate. This is how that works. This is what you do. A, you, you, you challenge a person to a debate, you need a panel of about 35 scholars in front of you to judge a debate. And um, what happens is the person who loses the debate has to give up their credentials and become the disciple of the other person. <laughs>
more meditative. You know, when you're young and strong, 